Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's webcast, Getting a Fix on Your Security Posture, What Your Logs Aren't Telling You, brought to you by Information Week, Dark Reading, NetIQ, and broadcast by United Business Media Limited. I'm Erica Joukowsky, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we start, we have just a couple of announcements. <clears throat> First of all, you can participate in the Q&A session by asking questions at any time during the webcast. Just type your question into the Ask a Question text area below the video window, then click the Submit button. At that, this time, we recommend you disable your pop-up blockers. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You may also download a copy of the slides by clicking on the Download Slide button located below the presentation window. If you're experiencing any technical problems, please visit our, our Tech Webcast Help Guide by clicking on the Help link below the media player. In addition, you can contact our Technical Support Helpline, which is also located in the Webcast Help Guide. Now on to the presentation, Getting a Fix on Your Security Posture, What Your Logs Aren't Telling You. Today we have two speakers. John Sawyer, Senior Security Analyst with InGuardians, and Brennan O'Hara, Security Solutions Manager for NetIQ. John Sawyer specializes in network and web application penetration testing. His experience in enterprise IT security includes penetration testing, system and network hardening, intrusion analysis, and digital forensics. John has developed and taught cybersecurity training for a large university and spoken at events for industry and law enforcement. He's also consulted with federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies on malware analysis, hacker attacks, and digital forensics. John is the author of the blog, Evil Bytes, at Dark Rating, and is a member of the winning team from DEF CON 14 and 15's Capture the Flag competition. Meanwhile, Brennan works for NetIQ's security management. Offer and he, he works for those, those offerings where he is responsible for identifying and developing market offerings that lead to innovative and more effective approaches for managing security compliance in complex environments. Brennan has eight years of experience in identity, access, security, and compliance areas. He came to NetIQ through its acquisition of Novell, where he was most recently solution manager for Novell's identity and access management projects. Prior to Novell, Brennan has led product marketing offerings for several different companies, including Netegrity, CA Technologies, and Improvada. John, I, I give you the floor. Thank you, Erica. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about getting a fix on the security posture within your organization and looking at how those logs can assist you in determining compliance, uh, what kind of attacks are going on within your organization, uh, finding new attacks, and uh, kind of what that means and looking at a couple of kind of how failures work uh, with logging, some of the typical pitfalls, and talking about how logging can actually detect real world attacks. And, and we'll look at some examples um, that I have from you know, a couple of penetration tests and and uh, incident response engagements that we've uh, worked on. So Eric has already covered my background a bit. Um, I am a senior security analyst within Guardians. I do a lot of uh, penetration testing, architecture review, incident response, and forensics. And uh, in the forensic side, you know, we see a lot of cases where we go in and we're looking for evidence of these intrusions. And what ends up happening is there's evidence in the logs all along that these things have taken place, but they've gone unnoticed. And you know, I want to talk a little bit about that today and you know, why those things go unnoticed and, and why people seem to think logging is so hard and you know, what benefits that logging and, um, can provide to your organization from a uh, compliance standpoint and actually detecting attacks. So first of all, looking at compliance, I mean, there's tons of different um, regulations and um, requirements out there that businesses have to adhere to. Uh, we've got PCI, DSSS, 
uh, which is the payment card industry data security standard, HIPAA for healthcare, NERCSIP for energy, um, NEI for nuclear energy, FISMA, government, GLBA, and SOX. And one of the things that we run into many times is that companies will purchase a log management solution or a security information and event management solution or a SIM, and they'll put these things in place, but they never bother to actually monitor them and see, you know, am I getting value from this product that we just spent a lot of money and put into? Or they'll spend a lot of money on the product, they'll put it in place, and then they'll realize, well, we don't really have the money to pay the analyst to uh, actually interact with these systems and maintain them, and, well, they end up getting laid off or retasked to do other things within the organization, and there's all this wonderful data that just kind of goes stale and isn't getting used. So in regards to compliance with PCI, you know, there's a, several different requirements um, that can lead towards compliance with PCI that really can um, benefit from practical logging and analysis. Um, for example, restricting cardholder, cardholder data access. You know, one of the things that we've noticed that you know, companies will go in and, and put in security controls, but they don't really know if those security controls are effective. Um, you know, if you implement a firewall that's going to prevent, say, you know, users within uh, marketing from being able to access the financial uh, data or the cardholder data or, you know, any of that information that, that falls within PCI, how do these companies actually know that those security controls are effective? I mean, one way is to do uh, some type of testing, like penetration testing, to see if those actually are working. But the other is to actually include logging and have that go to a central system where you can monitor any attempts to access that data that kind of falls without, uh, outside the realm of the roles of those people that you've defined have access. Uh, for example, you know, the firewall logs go to a system and you can flag any time someone that uh, is on a subnet or they fall within a, um, a group or a role that should not have access to the cardholder data. Um, same thing goes for um, regularly testing security systems and, and processes. Uh, for example, the vulnerability scan data. You know, a lot of times uh, companies will, you know, run a scan every now and then, maybe once a quarter or once a year, but they don't really leverage that information. While, you know, there are SIM products out there that can take that vulnerability data and map it to the systems that are being protected and actually give you a real picture of the risk that goes along with those systems and how exposed they, they are to different areas of the network. Um, and then default configurations. I mean, this is a, another example of um, where you can take configura configuration data auditing and feed that into a SIM or a log management solution and get uh, information back on how uh, secure these systems are, what kind of risk there are, and you know, show that, hey, I am compliant with PCI. HIPAA data is the same kind of way. I mean, there's um, requirement for information secure, uh, I'm sorry, uh, information system activity review. You know, is someone actually monitoring the systems? Uh, a lot of times um, within a SIN product, you can have a workflow that shows that, yes, someone indeed did view these events and they did um, check those off as being either false positives or true positives and have responded appropriately. You know, if it's an incident that they see in the, uh, the SIM, have they decided that it does need to be elevated for additional review somewhere? Um, review and update user access. Again, this kind of falls within monitoring those security controls and actually knowing that they're working, having the logging in place to be able to say, yes, we've updated the rules, we know that they're working, we can tell based on success and failures, um, auditing all the users that have access to PHI or personally um, personal health information. 
And then the incident response and goals and procedures. And again, you know, these things all tie back into logging. And a lot of people just, you know, they, they think that logging is difficult and they don't take the time to spend doing the analysis and, and pulling out the data that could really benefit them. With NERC SIP and NEI, um, you know, we've got requirements that apply to the energy sector, you know, nuclear power plants. Um, and you know, these, you would think, are obviously critical infrastructure for you know, the United States and, or uh, whatever country you may be in. But we find that logging is often, again, you know, either turned off or in a default state and not going monitor, not being monitored as it should be. Uh, with the sabotage reporting, you know, that's as simple as pulling in the logs and actually being able to determine, hey, did someone access this outside of the hours that they should have been? Uh, was someone accessing it that did not have the role, the responsibility for that product? You know, this could easily indicate a possible insider attack. Uh, with the cybersecurity requirements and the critical asset identification, you know, being able to have uh, network scans or vulnerability scans, or even pulling back NetFlow data to identify the hosts that are within the network. These are all different pieces that can take, you know, take logging to the next level and prov provide you with that ability to know that you're meeting those requirements. So in the grand scheme of things, what does compliance mean and being able to you know, meet all of those little requirements and, and being able to check off the boxes? Well, they provide nice, pretty graphs for executives. I mean, because in the end, isn't it that, isn't it the executives the ones that want to see the reports? They want to see, you know, a graph that shows, hey, we're meeting our goals and requirements. Um, you know, and, and that's something that a lot of the SIM products and log management solutions can provide for you. You know, they have the ability to say, hey, we've seen this number of events, and, and they'll give you a graph that shows, you know, we've had this many failed logins over the last uh, 30 days, 60 days, or six months. And they'll be able to show you a trend. You know, if you have uh, antivirus logs that are being fed into a, a log management solution or a SIM, you can say, hey, you know, we've noticed an increase in the malware that's being detected by AV. And that's something you might want to investigate and determine, hey, why are we seeing these increases? Is this something that means we're under more attack? Are we uh, not providing desktops that you know, are as secure? Are they you know, being exploited through these zero-day zero vulnerabilities that are present in Adobe Flash or uh, Adobe Reader? Or is this something where Maybe our web proxy isn't providing the filtering capabilities that we expect it should. Maybe our users are going to websites where there's content that you know, is actually malicious and, and attacking these machines. So you know, having a dashboard and having that ability to take a high-level look at the current events that are going in, on within an organ organization is extremely important. Um, but it does, you know, it does give those warm fuzzies. You know, being able to walk into your CEO's or CIO's office and provide a, a, a printout that shows a graph that says, hey, this is where we are. I mean, that's really nice. And, you know, this is something that C-level executives can take a look at and quickly say, hey, you know, there's a lot more green on here than red. That's good, right? And you can say, absolutely, and tell them why. And you can explain you know, what's kind of going into the graph and, you know, why these numbers mean what they do. So one problem that I have with meeting compliance is that a lot of times we run into organizations where they feel that compliance equals security, and that's not the case. You know, unfortunately, being compliant it, it often leads to this false sense of security because, hey, if, if I'm PCI compliant, then that means I'm secure, right? And, and that's not correct. I mean, we've seen numerous situations over the past five, six years where companies who have gone through and 
checked off all the boxes on their PCI compliance checklist and uh, gone through the audit with the um, QSA. Uh, the, they say they're compliant, yet there's all these security holes that are allowing attackers to come in and steal cardholder data. And you know, why is that? Well, a lot of that has to do with the fact that these are kind of a, you know, when you look at compliance, it's, it's a base set of recommendations. It's not like where you should stop. You know, you go through compliance, you meet the checklist. There's so much more beyond that. And it's kind of like a, you know, you must re be this tall to ride this ride. That's kind of where compliance is. You must be this tall to be compliant, but you need to go a little further to actually be secure. And we see that you know, loads of money are being spent on security products, but there's not a lot of focus on the process within the internal organization. You know, they're not taking the time to say, hey, we just put in this SIM. Now we actually need to have, you know, people that are looking at it maybe 24-7. You know, it kind of depends on what kind of organization you're in, what kind of attacks that you're concerned about and things like that. But someone needs to be looking at that data and knowing what's going on and being able to understand what's going on. You know, there's got to be some skilled analysts looking at the information, and there needs to be skilled incident responders who can take that data and then be able to move on and investigate an incident properly. And then being able to leverage those logs that are being collected and find a trail of what happened over time and what led up to the actual incident. Now going back to the logging with no analysis, the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report uh, puts out some really great information. And over the last few years, they've included a section um, that discusses some of the failures that they've seen within logging in organizations. And what gets me is that when you look at the numbers, in 2010, 86% of the data breaches that they investigated had evidence in their logs of the breach. Now, what does this mean? Well, it's simple. You know, they're taking the time to set up the logging, but no one's looking at it. You know, 86% in 2010. And two years later in 2012, the breach report shows that 84% had evidence in their logs. Why is this? You know, why, why, is, why is it that companies spend all the money to be compliant to put in these monitoring pieces, but then don't do anything with the data? You know, it's not that, that logging is hard or difficult. Logging isn't hard. Logging is very simple. I mean, practically everything out there on your network produces logs of some sort. For example, you know, you've got desktop operating systems that have logging features built right then. Is everyone taking advantage of those? No, they're not. And you know, looking at just desktop logs are an easy way to possibly pick up uh, a future insider attack. You know, it could be that you know, there's logs that show the user has elevated their privileges and they now have administrative access on the desktop and they could leverage those privileges to you know, steal password hashes that they then crack or they use in a pass the, pass the hash attack to gain access to other desktops, which could lead to full compromise of an Active Directory environment. I mean, there's all kinds of different things that you know, just by having the logs available and taking a look at them and knowing what to look for, which is sometimes difficult, uh, but comes with experience, you know, being able to have that data can have a profound effect on finding and preventing a lot of these breaches that we investigate. And logging doesn't, you know, the solution doesn't have to be expensive. Now, there are some really fantastic products out there that you know, are on the expensive side, but, you know, when you think about the cost versus functionality and the insight that you gain into your enterprise, you know, the cost is negligible at that point. Um, you know, it really comes down to how important is the data that is stored within your organization and, and to what lengths are you willing to go to protect and monitor that it is actually uh, secured and being protected.
Now, this slide just kind of looks at some of the sources of logs out there. You know, I mentioned operating systems, um, you know, Linux, Windows, Mac, all of those operating systems have logs. Um, you know, it's just whether or not you're taking the time to take that, those logs from those systems and report it back to a central area where you can actually monitor and provide analysis of those logs. Network devices, pretty much every network device, uh, switches, routers, um, anything on your network that you know, handles traffic going through has the ability to log data. Uh, one of the great features of uh, layer three switches and routers are NetFlow data. You know, actually providing a record of the traffic so that you can go back and determine all sorts of things. I mean, there's some great uh, sims out there and uh, network behavior anomaly detection systems that have the ability to take these NetFlow records and collect them and provide you with a picture of what's going on on your network. They give you. Uh, a baseline of what desktop systems should be doing or you know are are doing over time, and then when let's say a desktop starts acting as a server, maybe uh, it suddenly starts running an FTP server or a web server or an IRC server. Um, you know, one of the, these tools can actually flag that and say, hey, you know, we have uh, a system out there that has always been a client, but now it's acting as a server. That's something that needs to be investigated. You know, if you see that a host has uh, suddenly started transferring a lot of data, um, you know, there's research out there from uh, the U.S. CERT that shows that in the in the 30 days prior to uh, a disgruntled employee leaving, who is stealing, who plans to steal data, the last 30 days is that window of opportunity where they start downloading everything possible. And if you start seeing that there's a desktop suddenly downloading gigabytes and gigabytes of data from one of your servers, and that's out of characteristic of, of that system, that could indicate that that person is you know, possibly uh, trying to steal data and take it to a competitor uh, before they leave. So that's something to, to take a look at. Uh, applications. Applications are something that, that often goes overlooked. Um, applications do a lot of logging. Um, you know everything from desktop applications to you know Apache and IIS uh, running on servers and antivirus logs. Uh, these are rich sources of information. Um, there's a great presentation from HD Moore uh, last year at the uh, security summit in uh, in San Francisco where he was discussing how there are crash logs that come from Java that are easy to indicate the, a possible attack that you know someone has has performed a possible zero day attack against Java and being able to pinpoint that in your logs could show that hey we have a desktop uh, or maybe a server within our enterprise that is being targeted by attack intrusion detections uh, systems these are again excellent sources of data uh, application and hardware performance monitoring. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, examples further on about um, how these tools can actually provide really interesting insight into uh, detecting attacks when they're not even designed to do that. Uh, vulnerability scanners. These things produce a lot of data. And with the right tool and right sim out there, you can take that data and map it to your systems and be able to provide a high-level overview of where vulnerability is mapped to different areas within your enterprise and be able to um, take care of those and address those risks and know if attacks would be effective against them. Benefits of log analysis, compliance, we've talked about that already. Incident detection, again, we've, we've touched on that. Forensics, um, you know, going back to the Verizon data breach report, you know, 86 or 84 percent of organizations had evidence in their logs. You know, logs provide a rich source of information during uh, forensics. You know, if you're able to take these logs and centrally uh, store them and protect them from, you know, a, an attacker possibly being able to manipulate them, delete them, you know, that provides an excellent source of information being able to 
watch uh, the, the footsteps of an attacker as they go through your organization touching different machines, you know, logging in, you'll see those. You'll be able to see that you know, maybe someone exploited a system and you'll have a crash log event that shows that that happened. Troubleshooting, of course. Identifying new threats. Uh, this one's interesting because you know, it goes back to the whole detecting of anomalies, you know, detecting things that kind of fall outside of the normal baseline of a normal system. And vulnerability tracking, you know, we've talked about that already. So looking at the, the real world detection of attacks, you know, there's a couple of different areas that we, we can focus on. From the external side, worms, targeted attacks, penetration testing, there's all different types of things that you can detect. You know, there could be a worm that is exploiting a SQL injection vulnerability on IIS servers that are running a particular piece of software that has known SQL injection. You know, you'll see these things in the logs, and you can actually tell, um, you know, was it, you know, how long did it take for the attack to be successful and things like that. Um, internal attacks, malicious insiders, malware, rogue systems, you know, being able to have those logs that say, hey, this IP has never been used before, and we just saw this IP pop up on the network for the first time, and it started scanning systems. Well, obviously, you have a rogue system uh, that needs to be investigated. Malware, the same kind of thing. You know, pulling those AV logs back into a uh, central place where you can map what's going on and being able to see, you know, what has that malware done to the system? Is it touching other systems? And get a feel for the, kind of the collateral damage that's taking place from one infection spreading out to others. Now, from external detection, um, we were performing an uh, external penetration test um, a few weeks ago. And there, this particular organization, um, they, they provide, you know, they have a security team in-house and they do a lot of uh, analysis themselves. But they also have a MSP, a managed service provider, uh, who performs some additional uh, analysis of the logs that are being shipped out to them. And just a simple in-map scan or a network scan looking for what hosts are live and which um, ports are open, you know, the MSP flagged them within uh, about an hour or two of us performing the scan against their network. And those were perform uh, detected through the firewall logs because the firewall logs generated a bunch of uh, logs out to the MSP that said, hey, um, we're getting a lot of hits from this one IP address looking for uh, ports that are closed. And so all those denied messages made it to the MSP. The MSP looked at it and said, hey, there's a scan taking place. A web vulnerability scan. Now, web vulnerability scanners tend to be kind of noisy, as they are anyway. But this company, one of the things that they told us is that they do a lot of performance monitoring of their, their servers and their web applications. And one of the interesting things that caught the web vulnerability scanner was their user experience monitor. They have a tool uh, that, that looks through the Apache and IIS web server logs for um, HTTP status codes that indicate some type of error, whether the page is not found or Maybe you know there's a 500 uh, status codes indicating a um, internal server error. You know they actually monitor for these things, and because the web vulnerability scanner was causing you know errors to occur and was looking for a lot of files and directories that weren't there, they were actually able to detect the attack based on the the logs that were going into their user experience monitor, which I have to say I was kind of blown away to to see that. You know, it's the first time in uh, I don't know the six years or so that I've been doing penetration testing. It was kind of a shock to actually see someone detect it that way. Attack tool scans, um, things like uh, Nikto or WordPress scanner or some of these different uh, tools that have distinct signatures. 
IDS or intrusion detection systems can easily detect these because they have signatures for them. And in this case, uh, the MSP were able to detect the attack and notify the, our client that, you know, hey, we're seeing this attack. And of course, you know, they looked at the IP and they knew it was coming from us. But again, you know, having that data and being able to do the analysis, they detect that attack ahead of time and possibly prevent, you know, something that could have been harmful. Inter internal detection of attacks. Um, this one, again, this is the same organization, and this was probably one of the most impressive detection uh, that we've seen. Uh, VLAN hopping is a technique where uh, you plug into a network, and in this case, they were running a, a NAC product, a network access control solution that puts you on one particular virtual network. And then once you authenticate, it puts you on to the authenticated segment. Well, we performed an attack called VLAN hopping where we were able to uh, turn the switch port into a trunk port that could then jump us from the NAC VLAN to uh, the authenticated VLAN. Well, we performed the attack and we spent the entire day doing our internal penetration test. Well, the next morning, we had one of their staff members come in and say, hey, um, are you guys modifying the switches or making any changes to the switches? And we said, no, no, we, we haven't um, made any changes. And it turns out that uh, Tripwire was monitoring their uh, configuration and detected that, hey, this port just changed. The same goes with malware and attacker tools. Uh, their antivirus logs picked up the the uh, tools that we had dropped on a couple of the desktops, and then uh, host intrusion prevention logs. They were running a product that monitored the systems and were able to detect when we performed attacks against those and actually exploited them. Um, so there's all different types of detection methods and, and ways that you know these logs could be fed into different monitoring and, and uh, analysis solutions that can detect these attacks. So it's quite amazing what you can do if you collect the logs and do analysis of them. So now I'm going to turn uh, the presentation over to Brennan O'Hara uh, with NetIQ, and he's going to talk a, a little more about log analysis and what they can do to help you with your security posture. Hey, great. Thank you, John. Uh, hello to everyone. Uh, as John said, I'm Brennan O'Hara, a Solution Marketing Manager at NetIQ, and as the sponsor for today's webcast, I uh, want to thank you all for your attendance today. And uh, John, I want to thank you for sharing uh, your incredible base of knowledge and insight. Um, just in the uh, final few minutes here, in, in my, my wrap-up presentation, just want to spend a little bit of time talking about what NetIQ is hearing from our customers and prospects regarding their current operational state of security and some of their challenges and see how it aligns with uh, those of you on the call. You know, what we hear as key objectives from security professionals continues to be, hey, we need to protect our information assets, we need to demonstrate compliance, and wherever possible we want to add value to the business process through the use of security technologies and security best practice. <clears throat> but there are clearly many challenges, as, and John outlined many of these. There's different types of threats that are coming into your environment that you need to defend against. Uh, the computing environment is constantly changing. There's the introduction of you know, virtual workspaces, the cloud, and you know, this increasing proliferation of unmanaged mobile computing devices coming into the environment that's you know, creating all sorts of new havoc uh, for IT folks. And likely, your resources are stretched pretty thin uh, across multiple projects. You have conflicting priorities. And, and likely, with less budget and time than you had the day or year before. So, you know. That's a tough thing to do to manage against all of that, especially when the business is going to keep moving forward uh, with or without you, and they're, they're always going to side with productivity over a security. And what we find from that is all that constant change coupled with constant complexity, unfortunately, adds up to uh, loss of uh, control and, and loss of visibility. So today we've talked a lot about log management, about SIEM, uh, you know, as John said, um, you know, those technologies, they've been around for a long time to help address the challenges that we've talked about today to get help, uh, you know, you get a fix on your security posture, as John just reviewed. And, and as John has said, you know, 
log management, it should be easy, and there are lots of logs out there, um, but there are known, I think, historical problems with older generation solutions that are out there, <clears throat> and maybe these things are familiar to you, because the space, you know, log management scene technology, is, it's going on 10 plus years now, and some of those first generation tools have failed us. Um, you know, log management products have often proven to be too tactical or too limited in their function. So they may have helped you check off a compliance box, but have done little to provide any real security intelligence about threats in your environment. And, you know, as John said, there's many public examples where sadly we've learned that being compliant to the letter does not equal being secure. Uh, and conversely, some of the more complicated you know, event management products, they've proven to be too complex, too costly, too time consuming to properly configure and to tune. Uh, you know, when a change happens in your environment, the process to go back and configure for that is, it, it's, it's untenable. And so ultimately, some of those older, more complex products have failed in their ability to deliver desired security value as well. Uh, you know, there's many examples of these failed or limited deployments that are out there, and unfortunately, that's left many companies trying to make meaningful sense out of the flood of event data using a mishmash of tools, often forcing staff to revert back to even more time-consuming and resource-intensive manual processes. And, you know, given that backdrop, as John said, Sadly, we see repeatedly year over year in Verizon's data breach investigations report that the evidence is there of breaches in the logs, but they're unfortunately just, just going undetected. So in terms of, from a net IQ perspective, where does that leave you and where we think new generation solutions are now coming available that help mitigate some of those historical problems with complexity and ease of use and the output of information, you know, if you're in a situation where you're looking to supplement an existing solution, do a complete overhaul, or maybe roll out your first ever security management solution, and believe me, there are many companies out there that, that that's where they're at. They're still looking for that. They've been doing it manually all this time, and they're looking for something that's easy and that's automated for them. <clears throat> Some of the areas that we suggest at NetIQ that you focus on is certainly first and foremost, you know, identify your use case and need. It may be wow, we just failed an audit and we need to better address compliance reporting. Or it might be a more severe case where, oh no, we've just been breached and now we need to better understand our overall security posture and we want that 24 by 7 monitoring. We want event correlation. We want the ability to do advanced anomaly detection with the ability to you know, proactively identify and alert us of suspicious behavior in the environment. So many start with that need for compliance, as John talked about, but there's a desired growth goal to improve in security intelligence. So once you've identified that path, where you're going to start, um, be it log management or you know more fully functional SIEM solution, then you can begin to look for you know the capabilities that will be important for a successful deployment. And some of those things that that we would advise folks look at is you know how easy is it to deploy. The solution? How flexible is it? Um, how much hardware will be required to stand up the infrastructure? Is the product hardware appliance-based? Can I deploy um, in a virtual environment? How quickly can I scale the deployment? Does the product mandate that I need to also stand up a complex and expensive database or storage infrastructure? How adaptable is the product to my changing computing environment? Another area of consideration is how easy will it be to configure and tune the product for your environment? You know, how quickly can you establish, as John talked about, those, those baselines of normalcy? So I can get a handle on what should I expect from a system so that when something out of the ordinary presents itself, I, I can be advised of that. Uh, getting to that point, will that require extensive training? Will I need to learn a new scripting language? Will I need <clears throat> to dedicate an entire resource to manage this? Or is the product accessible enough in its administration to allow a broad base of staff to make use of it? And related to that, is the product accessible enough so my compliance brethren or maybe some business teams, they can use the solution independent of the security staff? 
And then further, how good is the product at quickly gathering and delivering to you that true actionable intelligence to enable you to respond to a threat? To what extent can it enrich all that event data coming in from all those different sources that John talked about and provide additional visibility and insight into the nature of the, of the event, such as you know, the who, what, where, and when of user activities, for example. Um, any solution that can compress that window of time that a threat has to create havoc, uh, that, that's certainly, certainly all the better. So <clears throat> just kind of in wrap up here, and I think you'll see here in my summary of pitfalls, there's a lot of things that John talked about. Things we, we think of when you look at extracting the greatest amount of value from your security monitoring product, you want to avoid the following. Uh, number one, not logging at all. I know it sounds simple, and John talked about it. Uh, you know, give, and especially given the time frame that security monitoring technologies have been in place, there remain many companies that continue to manage event data through manual processes that unfortunately expose the company to risk of audit failures, data breaches. Everyone has logs. You're only getting more of them, and, and you have to deal with them. Uh, pitfall number two, not reviewing your logs. Collecting and storing them is not enough. You, you need to review them. An active review will, will certainly help to deliver the information you need to know what's going on in your environment, respond to threats that I think in today's world we need to presume are there. They're just hidden from us currently. And provide you that knowledge that will enable more proactive security planning <clears throat> and better security decision making. Uh, not storing logs long enough. Um, I, I know it can be a problem to store log data that accumulates into terabytes worth of expensive storage space, but given the nature of today's threats that may percolate and bubble beneath the surface for months at a time when a threat is discovered and that forensic investigation begins, you don't want to be caught in a dead end state because log management or log information was deleted due to a limited re retention policy. So be sure you're storing your logs long enough for compliance and forensic needs. <clears throat> and for log uh, record prioritization, uh, John talked a little bit about this. Um, you know, many best practices will call for collecting only the important stuff. But what is important? Today, you may deem network intrusion detection logs and external-based threats as the most important thing we need to, to focus on. But you don't want to create a gap for yourself when tomorrow there's an, an information leak and an internal user investigation is suddenly most important and you haven't been collecting logs for that kind of analysis. If you make all the logs available for analysis, even if only a small percentage ever make it into an advanced correlation engine, you will at least have the data needed for gaining true actionable intelligence about threats in your environment. And lastly, number five, um, and again, John talked about this, uh, you don't want to only focus on perimeter internal network devices or servers. You also want to look at application logging. Uh, clearly, applications that are at the heart of all core business processes, and while the availability and quality of those logs differs pretty dramatically from app to app, you'll want to make sure that those logs are collected and uh, made available for <coughs> analysis and uh, long-term retention. Uh, so with that, just a quick summary. Um, today we talked about security monitoring. There's many different start points for helping you defend against some of the threats that John talked about earlier, and NetIQ is here to help. We have a broad portfolio of integrated identity, access, and security management solutions to help you address your data protection and compliance needs, all of which you can learn more about at netiq.com. And with that, I would like to just advance these slides and hand the uh, presentation back to, to Erica. All right. Thanks a lot, Brennan. Appreciate it. Uh, before we start today's Q&A, I just ask all the audience members to please fill out the feedback form that just opened up on your, your screen. To complete the form, just press Submit Answer button at the bottom of the page. And thanks in advance for filling this out. This actually helps us to better serve you for future presentations. Now on to the questions and answers. Um, I have a couple questions for 
you guys. Um, first of all, you know, we discussed this whole idea of of prioritization of, of logs, and I'm, I'm just wondering, John, if you could go further into depth about, about this. Um, when it comes to deciding what sources that you're going to analyze, if you don't have a lot of resources, how do you go about prioritizing? Um, what are some best practices you can offer, John? Well, uh, maybe Brennan, you could you could offer uh, some thoughts on that. I, I, I was trying to push the feedback slide, Erica, from our little web browser. So if you please could repeat that question, I'm so sorry. Absolutely. Um, when it comes to prioritization of um, of sources, what would you say are a couple of, of best practices um, in getting that process going and, and actually deciding on what sources that y you should be uh, focusing on? Uh, that, that's a great question, um, which I think John is certainly better uh, suited to, to answer. But from our perspective, again, as we talked about earlier, we, you, you, and, and John talked about it as well, you want to look at as, as many logs as you can you need to start somewhere, and it, it may be that you think, again, the, the most important thing should be on you know, external-based threats, and, and that's a good starting point, but I think you should also plan for you know, not creating that gap for yourself where you may be left you know, you know, with the rug pulled out from under you when all of a sudden something presents itself in another area where you haven't been focusing. And now you're you're left scrambling in a very manual, time-intensive process of trying to, you know, work back the forensics of of the source of that 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 threat. So I would look at everything in its entirety as as John laid out. There's many many things to start with. Start somewhere, but I I would have a plan to try to pull in all the the key things from an external and internal uh, prioritization. Probably apps maybe being secondary to that, but. Um, certainly all those, those typical things like that he talked about, um, internal network devices, servers, the perimeter, et cetera. Excellent. Um, John, I'm wondering if you could weigh in as well. Uh, when it comes to prioritization, what would you say are you know, some of the, the best practices in your mind um, in going through that process of, of deciding which sources to, to analyze most fully? Sure. Um, it's a lot on the the business uh, and what their focus is on. One of the things that we tend to ask our clients is, what is your worst nightmare? What is the thing that keeps you up at night? So you know, if a data breach of a particular source of information is your biggest concern, then start looking at the logs that are uh, focused on that particular area of data. You know, look at the logs of the firewalls that protect the data center that uh, where that system is contained. Look at the logs that are on those systems that are housing that data, and try to make it a little more goal oriented, so that you are uh, looking at the logs that that kind of mean the most to you. Because you know, let's say there's a huge business impact if if that data gets lost or gets out there. Um, that's that's kind of where we would try to prioritize, and then step back and, and, and look at you know those high risk areas, and just try to model your analysis around there and prioritize based on on those. All right. Well, that makes sense. I mean, uh, on the obvious next question, and and one which Brennan kind of answered a little bit in his pitfall section is, um, how do you go about deciding how long to keep your logs? Um, what would you say are the factors in in making that decision beyond the obvious of you know compliance mandates? A, a lot of times, it's going to depend on the tools that you choose and the the ability to um, keep the historical records. I mean, if you think about what makes up a log, logs are just text records. I mean, there's, it's text. Text compresses very easily. So if you wanted to collect as much data, um, you can actually have a shadow system that is collecting all the logs, while certain portions of the logs, if you, you, know, if, if you prioritize the analysis, you can have you know, those high-risk systems, those logs going to the SIM and doing your analysis there. But you could also have 
all the logs, every bit of them going to, say, a Linux system uh, running syslog that is taking them, compressing them, and archiving them over a period of time. I mean, it doesn't have to be a really expensive high-end solution to be able to do that. You know, you take the logs in, you compress them, and you put them on, you know, a multi-terabyte hard drive that, you know, isn't costing you very much money. And now you have a nice historical record that if something does happen, you can go back to that shadow system and take a look at those logs. Um, you know, and again, it really comes down to what are the goals of the logging and whether or not, you know, the primary solution that you're using for analysis can handle those and whether or not there's compliance reasons that, or specific requirements that require you to keep them for a certain amount of time. Okay. Well, you know, often budget is one of the biggest challenges in taking log management to the next level. Um, and we're fortunate to have kind of both sides of the house here today, um, both practitioner and vendor. So um, I'll start with you, John, from the practitioner's perspective, and then, Brennan, you, you can get your two cents in it as well, as far as best practices when it comes to getting the most out of your budget when it comes to log management. What would you say are the top one or two in each of your minds? Uh, from from my side, I, I tend to see groups on compliance being the primary driver for logging. And so they'll go and they'll look and they'll find a product that you know, promises the ability to provide compliance. And so they shove all their logs in here, but what they real, don't realize is that you know, there's going to be some limitations that maybe it didn't provide them with the best workflow for being able to handle incidents and, and investigating things as they come up. You know, maybe it just provides them with a pretty dashboard that says, hey, you're compliant. Um, you know, so they're not looking at the workflow and how that fits in and the capabilities for uh, doing analysis over time. Um, you know, I think that's the biggest issue is that they start logging for the wrong reason. And then uh, the other is simply not um, doing anything with the product once they get it in. You know, they get it in, they say, hey, I checked the box on the compliance checklist that says I'm compliant, I'm logging, I'm, you know, keeping logs for a certain amount of time, and they stop there. They simply aren't doing the analysis that, you know, and getting the for uh, what they bought that product for. Excellent. Um, Brennan, do you have a couple of, of things to add there as well as far as getting the most out of your budget from, from kind of the vendor's perspective? Yeah, I guess the, the comment I would make there is, you know, just going back to that backdrop of today, you know, resources being stretched so thin, you, you can't dedicate a full-time head to a, a solution, so, but you don't want to be caught in that catch-22 where you go for the simple solution that doesn't deliver the ultimate value you, you wanted. So if you can find one of the new generation solutions, look for something that is really easy to administer, to deploy, that will allow as, as many different people to access use of that tool so that you're not having to say, well, it's only this one person with a set skill set and a set you know, expertise to manage this. It's something that anyone on the team can pick up and run with as needed and maybe share beyond to, to, again, the compliance team or a line of business team so that as many people can touch it and, and take value from it as, as possible. Okay. John, the last question is for you. I mean, um, you've been in the business for a while. You've probably seen the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to log management practices. Um, what would you say are some of the, the biggest mistakes in your mind that organizations make, um, especially when they're trying to, uh, you know, increase the maturity of their, their analysis processes? What, what mistakes do they, do they make often? I think one of the biggest mistakes is underestimating the time um, and, and the processes that kind of go into analyzing logs and being able to take that data and make it into something that's actionable intelligence. Um, we, we see it all the time where uh, a customer will buy a product and the time for training um, or maybe someone leaves and they just shove someone into place who has no idea what they're doing with the product and um, they don't really know what they're looking for. And, and part of what it is is you really do need skilled people to understand what they're looking for. I mean, uh, a breadth of knowledge on 
you know, what's out there within the enterprise and being able to understand that events come in and then they bubble to the surface through Wix and they're looking at the dashboard and getting alerts. They have to be able to understand environment and be able to know that, hey, that event uh, is impacting maybe a high-risk system and be able to go from there and provide an accurate um, incident response process. Okay. Well, excellent. This, this concludes the, the Q&A section of, of this webcast. Um, but I wanted to give each of you about a minute or so to, um, to go ahead and just kind of give some closing comments. Uh, John, you want to start? I'm um, sure. I, I think um, you know, for any organization to do logging, um, they need to go back and decide why they're doing the logging. I mean, you know, logging is great, and being able to have that data is a great resource. But um, for one, you know, they need to understand they're doing it. Uh, is compliance the the main goal? Is it from a hardware troubleshooting perspective? Do they, do they feel like they need a a better uh, understanding on in the thousand uh, logging solution that they they choose uh, around those goals and focus on the high risk areas first and and be able to map those back to to know that you know we are looking at those areas that are of the biggest concern and that we're protecting the data that if we you know had a breach just the kind of stuff that that is damaging to the company the brand and uh, making sure that those goals are being met by what, whatever uh, tool or process that they choose. Excellent. Uh, Brennan, do you have a couple of closing remarks as well? Yeah, just to, to, to echo on that, um, you know, I, I think from our perspective, you know, today we'd all agree it's, a, it's an always-on business environment, and with that we need to presume that it's a, there's an always-on threat environment, uh, a threat culture, and I think people should just presume that that culture is, is already somewhere in-house, somewhere there is a, uh, some type of threat to the environment that's either active or passive in, in your world, and you need to look for a solution that is easy to use, easy to deploy, tune and configure so that you can quickly identify that threat, respond to it, and compress the amount of time that that threat has to, to wreak havoc in, in your environment. And if you map that solution set against the things John talked about, then I think you're, you're well on your way to a, a good start. Well, excellent. Thanks so much, gentlemen. Um, for the audience, for, your, for more information related to today, today's webcast, feel free to visit any of the resource links open in front of you. Within the next 24 hours, you'll receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a, a link to today's presentation on demand. And additionally, you can view today's event on demand by visiting www.netseminar.com. Thank you very much for attending today's webcast, Getting a Fix on Your Security Posture, What Your Logs Aren't Telling You, brought to you by Information Week, Dark Reading, and NetIQ. This webcast is copyright 2012 by United Business Media Limited. The presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted, if that is the case, by Information Week, Dark Reading, and NetIQ, who are solely responsible for its content, and the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and their opinions. On behalf of our guests, John Sawyer and Brennan O'Hara, I'm Erica Chikowski. Thanks for your time, and have a great day.